Okay. So first up this morning, we've got uh, Johan Cardina. Uh, Johan is um, currently a web, de a web dev working in Melbourne. Uh, he's a fellow for Code for Australia. He's studying a new career in software development, so he hasn't done any work on the Linux, the Linux kernel yet. Um, he's working with, the, with DELP, which is the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, and Parks Victoria to build the next generation of tools for um, mobile biodiversity. Uh, he's trained as an electronics engineer in France, um, and is currently also teaching kids to code in Carlton in Melbourne uh, at the Coder Dojo, and preaching um, to his partners about free software. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Johan. Thank you. All right. Um, have anyone heard of Code for Australia? Yeah, great. So um, <laughs> Code for Australia started in Australia in 2013. So it's based on the same principle as uh, Code for America that started in the US in 2009. So we are a community that tried to help the government to realize their IT project um, by providing civic-minded solution. Uh, so Code for Victoria is a program that's run by Code for Australia. A uh, few months ago, they started the Innovation Challenge. So we pick uh, nine people and we put them in different uh, uh, place in, at, at the government. Uh, I'm working currently with DELP and Park Victoria. Others are working with the Department of Treasury and Finance or Legal Aid Victoria or other uh, departments. So for me the challenge was to improve the collection uh, and availability of biodiversity data. So the Victorian state has been running uh, a biodiversity database for about 30 years. It started on paper and then moved uh, uh, on IT solution. Uh, they had various different versions of that software. Uh, so it's what you can call legacy software. Uh, so there's another person in my team. She's not here today. Uh, her name's Veronica. So she's classically trained as a, a DevOps and she worked with the Spanish government for about 10 years, and me. Uh, so I'm a web developer, try to do a bit of everything. So I'm going to start by talking about biodiversity uh, in Victoria, and then we'll see uh, the solution that we try to bring. So why is biodiversity important? So in Victoria, it's part of the ident identity of the land. So for thousands of generations, Aboriginal communities, uh, they cared for the land. So healthy environment uh, is a central piece of uh, Victoria values and aspiration for the future. Uh, so there's different um, parts that make biodiversity important. So few of them are uh, essential by essential services. I mean, uh, a clean environment will give you uh, fresh water, food, uh, it's also part of the Victorian way of life. It is a reason why they call, it, um, they call Melbourne the most livable city in the world. It's also because of the uh, parks and the uh, uh, regional uh, parks from inside the city and outside, uh, and the social value. So if you have clean environments, you can get uh, cultural, recreational value. So you get healthy people and healthy society. Um, so the issues that are facing the biodiversity in Victoria. So 1750, this is a very low resolution of a map that will show you the uh, different uh, part of the biodiversity in Victoria. So all the different colors, they, they simply mean, um, uh, for example, the green one is uh, wetlands. Uh, you can get desert area. You can get all different kind of uh, uh, biodiversity um, location, and then at about 260 years later in 2011, all the white uh, marks are reclaimed land. So uh, we lost uh, biodiversity in those places. Uh, it's, so the Victorian uh, state is the most clear state in Australia. So that means most of the land has been reclaimed for our society. Um, so there's about 4,000 uh, hectares a year of uh, land that are is being claimed back uh, by the society. Uh, climate change, loss of habitat, weeds, pests. So that's 
just to name a few of the, the danger that, that is facing the um, uh, Victorian biodiversity. Um, just to give you an idea of uh, this data, so back in the 80s, we had a lot of people working for the government that were sent into parks and uh, forests to survey the land. Um, now the whole thing changed. For example, the Gippsland region, uh, it's the whole southeast part of Victoria. Um, there is about 41,500 square kilometers, and there's uh, only 10 state employees uh, that are being uh, full-time paid for surveying the land. So we used to know a lot about, uh, or about the country, and now the, the more we go, the, the more cuts is being applied to the budget, and so the less uh, resource we have to actually know about the, the countryside. Uh, so this is why we, um, uh, so this is why uh, the Australian, uh, the Victorian states is requiring more and more uh, data coming from the citizen scientist world. So, like I said, it used to be pay contractors or a Victorian state employee who used to survey the land, and now uh, most of the data is being collected by citizen scientists. Uh, so citizen. Uh, Citizen science and open science, uh, it's just a word uh, that will describe any kind of uh, non-professional scientist uh, doing survey and science in general. Um, so those people, they, most of the time, uh, they will care about a um, few different things. Uh, the most uh, important one will be transparency uh, in the methodology, observation, and collection of data. So they spend a lot of time and, and money collecting data, and what they want is to have, uh, they want to have access back to this data in a clear format. So public availability and reusability of scientific data, and public accessibility and transparency. So like I said, they spend a lot of time collecting the data. They, they wish uh, for an easy way to access the data and be able to come back and and see what the community has done. So just, I'm gonna show you now uh, what the Victorian States is actually uh, giving up to, to people to do that, that job. So that's the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas. Uh, so it's a very old school system uh, that will allow people to do data collection and that will allow people also to get data from the system. So. That's just a small animation to show you kind of the usability of the thing. Uh, so the main problem with that system is that people don't know how to use it. So the state has to uh, spend a lot of money in trainings that they are running in regional Victoria, so to help people uh, understand how to use the system. And most of the time, people, they just uh, don't use it. Uh, so I'm talking about citizen scientists and government workers because it's just too slow and too hard to use. Uh, there's some weird feature like uh, if you press the, the back button on your navigator, you will, go, you will be logged out of the application. Uh, who knows why? Another interesting one is that every time you will over on top of image, it will uh, make a call to the server to download a new version of that image. So if you just like, sitting at your desk, uh, waving the mouse around, you kind of DDoSing the server uh, for no reason. Uh, so that's, that's one of our uh, key stakeholders. So he's working in Bairnsdale in rural Victoria. Uh, so I spent the day with him to try to understand um, what, what his job looked like and how we can help him. So we went out on the field and he just uh, used a piece of paper and just by hearing uh, birds, frogs, and by seeing uh, different kind of fauna and flora, he was able to put up a list of about 60 different species in like 20 minutes, so that was pretty impressive. But then we went back to the office and he spent most of the day trying to input that data. So. Uh, it's, it's a huge loss because the guy has to uh, manually select what he think is the most interesting species before he enter it in the system because he doesn't have time to, to put 60 species so he will pick the, the 10 uh, best ones that he think are the best and then put it into the system. Uh, but by talking to scientists that are using 
the data on the other end, we learn that uh, most of the time they don't care about those very rare birds and species because those are the exception. But most people think this is the most important data, uh, where the most important data is actually the, the common species. Like for example, we have pretty much no record of magpie in Melbourne. Um, so we don't know where they live, we don't know where they breed, we don't know how many they are in the city and it's one of the most common birds. Uh, but we have very interesting record about some very rare plants in uh, regional Victoria that no one really care about. So there's a mismatch between what people think is important and what scientists need. So to learn more about the system, we went around uh, regional Victoria uh, with amazing public transport, lots of train and buses. Uh, so we went to visit a very wide different uh, range of people. Uh, so people working at DELP, uh, Parks Victoria, and also uh, citizen scientist group. So most of them, they will organize to do like a weekend trip in the forest to collect data. There's also association like uh, BirdLife Australia, uh, Melbourne Museum, Australian Museum. Uh, so that was on our first month. We, we tried to interview them and run some workshop. Uh, and so we end up with a lot of data. Uh, a lot of people were very mad about the whole thing. Uh, this is one of the tools we use every day, Trello. So we try to make everything uh, public so that everyone can see what we are doing and our work and our progress. So that's just some of the, the stakeholders. So as you can see, there's a lot of people who are involved uh, and are working around that database. So it's just a list of species with like GPS location, time, date, and the method you use to collect the data. But then you will have university, you will have uh, land management, uh, fire control is the biggest one. So they will use the data to, to plan the, the fire burn in Victoria. Uh, since uh, 2009, they passed a law that say 10% of the biofuel mass uh, need to burn every year. So they will run queries on the database to select the most appropriate place to burn. Uh, so that's why we need uh, more data. Uh, so just to talk a bit about how we do things uh, at Code for Australia. So we try to be open and transparent. Now, there's only two people working in my team. So uh, we, we do what we can do. So mainly the difference between being open and transparent. So transparent, uh, you work in the public, uh, but you don't specifically enable participation. Uh, so we try to, to, to bring participation by running workshop. And we, we don't ask uh, what our next feature should be to um, the management of Park Victoria or DELP. We try to ask the citizen what they want and what they need. Um, so that's. So I will say we, we don't work fully in the open because uh, there's some stuff that we simply can't show because of various government organizations that don't especially allow you to, to display everything. Uh, but we try to be actively transparent. So we try to write down all of our meeting. We put it as a Trello board. Uh, it's all available on our blog. So if you want to know more about, uh, you could read that. Um, so all we do things, so we, we try to show them what's possible. Uh, so the, it's, it's a six months uh, program, so there's only so much you can do. Uh, when I first arrived, I asked the, there's a guy who work at uh, DELP and he's doing alpha shift every, every week uh, and he's in charge of maintaining that system, the whole system. Uh, so first, first thing he told us is that we should uh, do everything from scratch and, and just throw away the whole thing because it, it's very messy. Um, so when they, they bought the application, it was supposed to be open source. So they actually, they, they own the, the source code. You, you, can, you can see it if you ask for it, but it's not publicly open, but there's no documentation. Um, it's using some uh, very uh, old version of uh, Oracle database. Uh, they spend the last two weeks trying to move to upgrade to a new version. So the system went down for 10 days and they didn't succeed, so we had to roll back the whole thing. Uh, so we built for and with citizen. So that's, that's what I was talking about with workshop. So we try to ask people what they want and so we integrate those features. Uh, so that's a very powerful weapon for us because all of the meeting we spend with our government partner, they try to bring ID, let's do this, let's do that. But in the end, we always come back to what the citizen asks us to do. 
Uh, we operate in public, so we have a blog, mailing list, uh, or all of our Trello accounts is publicly available, and there's an open source repository with our code uh, on GitHub. And we help build an ecosystem. We try to do things that will be reused by other parts of the government or other team from within Code for Australia. Uh, this is a slide I really like to show my government partner to show them what agile means. So basically, they have a, the way they do things is that they will, they will work in secret. They, when they're running IT project for like a new website or a new application or whatever, they, they try to hide it from the public as long as they can because they have a huge history of non-delivering projects. Um, so there's an interesting stat that Code for Australia always, re always reuse. Uh, it's 95% of projects over $1 million fail uh, because of that reason, because it takes three years to deliver. And three years later, the requirement change, of course. So, so we try to build, we try to, to build feature by feature uh, on a weekly or two weekly basis. So we do prototype, we, we test them with our user. We go out in the field to, to meet uh, those users. And, and then we, we get the feedback and we try to work on this. Um, so one of the first uh, thing we, we work on was a, a data standard definition. So they were running their own uh, standard for, the, for storing the biodiversity data. Um, so that, that's one of the first points uh, we needed to, to, in, to increase because if you're running your own standard and then New South Wales is running its own and, and uh, other Victorian states are running their own standard, then we, you, we can share and collaborate on the data. So that's a very bad problem because uh, there's no wall at the border yet of Victoria. So species, they move around and, and, and we need to be able to to share the data with uh, new software, for example, or, or we need to, to use their data when we see like a species moving around, uh, we should know about. Uh, so, the, so we use something called Darwin Core. Um, so it's a open source uh, standard definition that's being used by some people across the world and it's like the de facto standard. So we try to invite them to use uh, that new standard definition, uh, but it's very hard to change things. So that, that took us about a month, and then we realized uh, it's not actually going to happen because by the time you let everyone know about your project, and then there's like discussion and meeting and meeting. So we only had six months to make change. So we kind of uh, left that on the side and, and just leave it as a suggestion for them. Uh, so the architecture of our uh, prototype. So um, basically, we couldn't change much. Uh, we tried to, I don't know if you, if anyone is working with government, but basically they use their own um, Amazon service kind of thing called Cenitex, uh, which stands for uh, some uh, IT excellence, whatever. So basically, they overcharge uh, government uh, organization with, for example, uh, we tried to open a port on our application, cost about a thousand dollars and took a few weeks. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. Uh, we tried to ask them for like a VPN access. Uh, we're still waiting for it. We tried to ask them for like a development server so we could make modification without breaking everything and we're still waiting for it. So uh, actually in six months, if you try to work with them in that way, it's not going to be possible. So, so we went the other way, like many teams at Code for Australia. Uh, we went like the scrapping way, uh, try to get the data uh, in our own way, so without asking for permission. Uh, so you do things and, and you ask for permission later. Uh, and it's much easier that way because they will see the results. If I ask them, uh, an endpoint for a REST API that will do this and that, they will be like, yeah, maybe, maybe not, and that because they don't see the value of it. But if you create it and then you show them, then they will see the value and, and you can get change much faster that way. Um, so the way we don't think is that the, the current system is giving to people like a um, XML RPC API. I, I never really work with that, but um, 
So you, you send XML requests, and it will send you back uh, like a JavaScript string, um, but you can't really run anything on it. You can, it's not like a JSON object or anything. It's like uh, there's some function in it. There's some, the whole thing is broken, so it's very hard to parse. Uh, and because the, the tool that they are using to parse that data is not uh, documented, was very hard for us to actually discover how that API is working. Uh, but we, we get to the point where uh, we are currently running, so that like the blue cloud is kind of uh, an interpretation of the, the stuff that we, we've done so far. So basically there's a, a two big projects. One is, is a species, uh, species list API. Uh, so all of the biodiversity projects, they always uh, evolve around an official species list because when you name species, you want it to be the same across the whole state. Uh, so the way they used to do it is that they had an Excel spreadsheet that was sent around the government. Uh, scientists will update the spreadsheet and then send it back and forth. So it was very hard to get consistent data and a uh, lot of broken things happen, of course. So we invite them to quit uh, that way of doing things. And so we, we build a, a REST API that will uh, that's available to everyone in Victoria to, to query. So basically, if you, you can, if you start, we use it in our application for autocomplete feature, but another team at uh, Code for Australia is using it for um, a plain fire burn application. There's other applications that are being developed in, in the government that, that will use that, that API. So it's much easier for people to use a REST API than downloading an Excel spreadsheet and, and doing processing on it every time. And the other part is to build a REST API that will wrap that XML RPC API so people can easily build their own application. So we build those two APIs. And then on top of that, we, we build our own application. But the goal is uh, to, at some point, publish them on data.vic uh, so people could use it, could use it uh, on their own project or when they're running GovAC, for example. A lot of people are at the government, they are very proud of saying that they are sharing data and they're doing open source things, whatever, but uh, DELP is a very good example of uh, open data, but not so much. So basically, they take a, a dump of the database and they put it on data.vic, and then what do you want to do with that? So when, when kids arrive at uh, GovHack, uh, they spend a day trying to figure out how to use the dump. And then th by the time you figure it out, uh, it's over. You don't have time to do anything else. So we, we shouldn't even allow anything like that on, on those portals because it's a, use, um, it's, it's a useless way to, to do things. That's, so that's uh, to show you one of our prototypes. So it's, uh, it works on mobile. Uh, here I'm using the autocomplete feature. So people can, if you start typing POS, and you will get the list of possum. Uh, so y we went down to only four or five different fields. Based on your phone and device, uh, they will try to get the, location, the GPS location, the time. So all of those things, they used to manually ask for it on the desktop application. That, by the way, doesn't work on iPad or iPhone. So there's no way for you to do it on mobile. Uh, and, and our goal is for people to, if they want, uh, leave the paper at home and just go around uh, and do survey with their phone. Um, so we will end up with 100% of the data actually being useful. Because at the moment, a lot of people are collecting data, but then it's, it's sitting on their desk, uh, wardrobe or even floor drop, because there's so much data. And then uh, who has time to enter everything? Uh, so then we went around for testing. So that's the same user you see uh, a bit earlier. So uh, now he's using this application to go around and he's able to record uh, all of the species that he can find. Um, our goal is to, our next goal now is to, to make it available offline. Um, so that's the difficult part at the moment because we try to push web technologies as much as we can. The government, they try to push apps as much as they can. I'm not sure why, maybe because they like the icon on, 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 your, on your phone, or maybe it's because when they do promotion, they can say, hey, download on the App Store, and it sounds very professional. But we think uh, at Code for Australia, everything should be web-based. 
Um, but one of the biggest challenge here is that most of the Victorian countryside doesn't have uh, connectivity. Um, and our key partner, uh, Parks Victoria, they all bought a fleet of iPhones. Uh, so we're using uh, service workers to do an offline web application. But because everyone's using iPhones now, they, they will have to wait at least one or two years be, uh, for that feature to be available on those devices. But yeah, that's, that's where we are at the moment. Um, if you want to contribute, uh, you can go to our GitHub. Yeah. So um, Code for Australia uh, on GitHub, then you can see all of the source code for all those API, the documentation. It's not yet published uh, officially because we're still working on it, but you can even contribute if you feel like it. Um, if you want to contact us, uh, so we have, you can join the Slack channel of, of Code for Australia if you have any suggestion or question, and, and the whole team will be happy to answer. And, and yeah, that's, that's about it for me. Uh, we've got about four minutes for questions, if anybody's got one. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Johan. Um, from memory, I think the Victorian government has a role open for Open Data Manager. What would you like that person to do to help projects like the Biodiversity Atlas? Um, so I know about... Uh, I don't know if you heard about data.vic.gov, like the open portal. Um, so that's a big project, but there's only actually two people working on those data sets. So it's very time consuming to clean up data and to organize it. Um, <clears throat> I guess they will need to have more resources uh, to be able to do the things right, because th I know those two person personally, and, and they're very good at what they are doing. They're just lacking time and, and resources. but. I'm guessing that with more resource, uh, great thing could happen because there's a volunteer on the government side to do the things right. It's just that most of the time they don't know what to do. And when they're being asked, uh, when, they, when they want answers, uh, their go-to place will be to ask people at PwC or Deloitte or, and I'm not uh, spitting on those companies, but and then those guys, they will try to sell them something. And most of the time you don't sell open source, so. Uh, so it's not going to happen if we keep going that way. Uh, but I don't know if that answers your question. But <laughs> thank you. I'm curious, is there an emerging international standard for this kind of data collection? Yeah, so the one I talk about, the, so there's multiple of them. Then you, you can just pick. Uh, your favorite one. Uh, their win core, I will say, will be the, the most used one at the moment. Uh, but maybe we could just start by having a standard from within Australia. Uh, so at the moment, there's like a, a portal called the Atlas of Living Thing Australia, so where everyone can uh, send data, but they don't go through the same verification process. So then scientists, they don't really want to use it because anyone can input data. The verification process is a bit dodgy for some reason. I don't know that they, they don't trust it. So that's why people, they try to only go to that Victorian biodiversity atlas thing because they know that um, as scientists are checking every single entries uh, and they ask for more information if they want to. But yeah, I will say that um, they will need to start to have like a well, first, they will need to start uh, to avoid doing the same thing on every state because there's probably a guy just like me doing the same thing in New South Wales. We could be just pulling resources together and, and do one thing that will work across all states because there's not many differences between collecting biodiversity data in Victoria and New South Wales, for example. Uh, but yeah, more, more collaboration, that, that would be great. Cool. Well, thank you, Johan. Thank you.